Hello, we want to welcome you to the worship of God here at the First United Methodist Church. We continue to bring you the service to your homes, and we're so delighted that you can join us, and we're so appreciative for all of you who continue to pray for us and pray for the ministry. We thank God for those of you who have volunteered to call the members to check in, and we're committed to calling everyone to check in once a week. Now, if you have not received any calls and you would like for someone to check in on you, uh, call the Morgan at the office or leave a voicemail, email us and let us know uh, what your phone number is so that we can uh, call you and make sure that we're checking in for everyone. We want to thank all of you who have uh, donated uh, $10 extra money materials for the masks and uh, we're hoping that we can get the masks to Megan's unit uh, they will be deploying in a, in a couple weeks so hopefully we will have all the masks gathered to send to Utah and make sure that the maintenance crew of the Hill Air Force Base uh, that they will have their masks. We want to do our scavenger hunt icebreaker for this week and uh, I want you to share with your family or whoever is with you uh, what is some something crazy something crazy that you have done within your house in the house it has to be in the house to to reduce the tension to reduce the cabin fever and uh, I was struggling a few days ago uh, two of my close friends lost their father and uh, I was having a hard time a lot of stuff going on so I decided to go into the kitchen make some dinner and I videotaped myself dancing African uh, with African music and then sent it to my sister and sent the video to a couple of friends. It's um, uh, you know, less than a minute. So if you could share something that crazy that you have done, something fun uh, in order to stay sane in your house. If you have a video, send it to Morgan. We'll put it up in the update or just call a friend and let them know what you're doing to stay sane. And we're going to begin with our call to worship, and I'm going to have Morgan at the office who is going to be helping us out to do the call to worship and the opening prayer. Will you please join me in the call of worship? Stay with Christ, and Christ will stay with you. Listen for God, and God will speak. Seek the Spirit, and the Spirit will be revealed. For the Spirit is already here inviting us to stay. Please play with me. Eternal God, we are here, yearning to know you more fully. Stay with us as we worship this day. Reveal yourself in the words that are spoken, the songs that are sung. Help us understand your truth and embrace your life-giving power. Revealed within your enduring word. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen.
scripture reading for today comes from James chapter 1, verses 2 through 12. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you may mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must, be, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all he does. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position, but the one who is rich should take pride in his low position, because he will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossom falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Blessed is the man who, pr who preserves under trial, because when he stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. On November 21st of 2019, Elon Musk was in Los Angeles and he was going to reveal to the whole world the first electric bulletproof cyber truck for Telza. It did not go very well. I don't know if you saw on the news what happened, but you see, he had this uh, truck that looked like an armored truck and it was electrical and he was there in an audience and uh, the car was on the platform and uh, he called an assistant and he said to the assistant, I want you to go up to the car and take a sledgehammer and hit the car and he stood up there and took the sledgehammer and hit the door and the driver's side and there was no dent and everyone in the crowd went, oh, then Elon Musk looked at his assistant and he said, I want you to do it again, but this time put all your muscle into it. And this man took the sledgehammer and he just ripped into the side of the car and there was no dent and everyone just went, whoa. And then Elon Musk looked at his assistant and he said, would you please grab a rock? And I want you to hit the bulletproof window. Just take it and just throw the rock right into the window. And the assistant looked at the rock and he wound up just like a pitcher and he threw the rock right at the window and it cracked. And the whole audience gasped in shock. And Elon Musk, trying to play off the shock, said to his assistant, okay, <laughs> hit the other window, but, but not, not too hard, not too hard. And he just kind of tossed the rock on the window and crack! It also cracked. And the whole crowd, you could hear a gasp and even a chuckle. Everyone was shocked. But this great cyber bulletproof truck, Telsa truck, that was going to be sold to the world was a complete dismal failure. It was a disaster. You know, that makes me remember the believers in Jerusalem. They were so excited that they had received the gospel. Peter preached to them in Jerusalem and they heard the message in their own language, people from all over the world and those Jewish people who gave their lives to Christ. And it was not too long after that, that the window of their lives came crashing in. Persecution broke out in the church. The believers were being persecuted by the religious leaders. And they were scattered all over. They went all over the world. And then the persecution followed them wherever they went. And you know, if you read the book of Acts, even the Apostle Paul, before he was converted, was one of those who went all the way into Syria, into Damascus, to arrest Christians and to throw them into prison. This is the context in which James writes to the believers, and he is trying to have us to raise the question, how do we respond to trials when they come into our lives? 
How do we respond to trials when, when we're living our perfect lives, we're living our wonderful lives, we're healthy, we're happy, there is commerce happening, and then suddenly a trial comes and it breaks the window of our lives? How are we to respond? This is an important question for us to ask ourselves, especially in the age and the day that we're living today. We're living in the day of a pandemic, and over 40,000 Americans have died. We are living in dangerous times, and we know that there are a lot of people who have gotten sick. We're close to a million people in the United States. We're close to, to, to seeing uh, people in our community sick. I have had friends who have been sick. I've had friends who have died of COVID-19. How do we respond to trials when they break into our lives? Now, this is what James says. And I want you to look at verse 2 because he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. I don't know how you take that, but it almost seems like morbid spiritual advice. To consider it all joy. <laughs> when life breaks the window of your car, when your life is shattered, when you get sick, when your business goes bankrupt, when you lose your job, when a loved one becomes ill and they pass. Consider it all joy. James, are you serious? Why is he telling us this? You see, if you look at the verse, you will, not cons you will not pick this up unless you read the Greek, the original, because it's a command. In the Greek, it is a command. It is not a suggestion. He's not saying, well, let me give you a little suggestion. He's saying, I command you. It's an imperative for believers to face trials with an attitude of joy. Now, why is this important? Why is facing trials with an attitude of joy. All right, let me tell you first of all what he's not saying. He is not saying feel happy when you're in trials. No one feels happy. I'm sure Elon Musk was not very happy when he saw that his, his car got smashed. The bulletproof car got smashed in front of the whole world. If I were him, I would, just have, I would have just gone to the corner and cried. Believers were crying. Believers, when they felt the heat of persecution, they were heartbroken. They were heartbroken. So it's not don't feel sad. He's saying you need to have a mindset of joy. And, and I want you to see this because he says, consider it pure joy whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, the word face here is a stronger word in the Greek. It's the word that is used in Luke chapter 10 when robbers uh, trap this man on his way to Jerusalem in the story of the Good Samaritan. And uh, this man fell into the hands of robbers. And, and what James is saying is the word face would be equivalent to the word mug. Consider it all joy when you get mugged by trials. And he's saying trials of all kinds. Trials of every size and every shape and every color. Some people in our community are facing the trial of death. I can't tell you how many of my friends have had loved ones lost in New York City. There are some who are facing financial difficulties. Their businesses are going under. There are people who have been furloughed. They don't know how they're going to pay their rent. And then I got a call a few days ago where people in my community and the Southern Caribbean region of Costa Rica don't have food. They're starving. And a friend sent a video to all of us who, who live in different parts of the world crying. We need food for our people. How do we respond when those trials enter our lives? And remember that James is not saying that, that 
Life is without trials. Trials are expected. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where someone or something is going to throw a rock at our lives and crack our windows. How do we respond? He says, respond with an attitude of joy. He's saying, make your trials work for you and not against you. Make your trials count. Why? Why is he saying that? Make your trials count? Make your trials work for you and not against you? Why? Well, look at verse 3. He says, because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. He's saying that one reason why we're to have an attitude of joy when we get mugged by trials is that trials have a way of testing our faith. Trials have a way of putting heat into our faith, into our lives, to purify us and to make us stronger. Do you believe that? You see, there is no man or woman of God who became great without being tried greatly. We have to make trials work for us instead of against us. And that is the purpose of testing. Testing is not to destroy our faith. Testing is to build our faith. And it produces, when our, our faith is being tested, it produces perseverance, it produces endurance. You know that happened to Father Abraham. Abraham is the number one figure, is the father of the Jewish faith. He's considered the father of the Islamic faith. And we consider him the father of our Christian faith. He was a great man of faith, yet he was tested. God called him out and sent him to a land that he did not know, a land he did not grow up. He said, leave your home and go where I show you, because I will make you into a, I will give you a family and I will make you into a great nation. And I will bless you so that your descendants will be a blessing to the rest of the world. And what happened? God promised him that, and Abraham got old. Abraham, 25 years went by after the promise, and he could not conceive, and he had lost faith, and he had given up on God. And one day God showed up and said, by this time next year, you're going to have a child. He was almost 100 years old, and Sarah, when she heard it, she laughed. When the angels announced that she laughed. Why? Because this was pre Viagra days, folks. They were too old to conceive. And God was testing Abraham. Because sometimes we feel that time is passing us by. Sometimes we feel that opportunity is the turtle that never showed up. Sometimes we feel that the time is as sharp as a butter knife. We cut, we cut, we cut, we cut, and nothing gets carved up. Nothing happens. And in the midst of nothing happening, God did what was humanly impossible and allowed Sarah to conceive. And they had a boy. They had a family. Isaac, the son of promise, came. And do you know what happened about 12, 15 years later? God says to Abraham, you know that son, the only one that you have, the one that I'm going to make a great nation out of, can you just take him up on a hill and sacrifice him? What would you, man, I would have had a big argument with God. I, I, are you kidding me? What are you asking me to do? This is the son of the promise, remember, remember? But no, he took his son on top of a mountain to offer a sacrifice, and his boy said, Dad, I see the wood, I see the fire, where is the lamb? And Abraham took him and put him on the altar. And as he was getting ready to sacrifice him, the angel of the Lord said, Stop, Abraham! Now I know that you believe in God. Now I know that you have been tested and you have been found faithful. There was endurance, there was perseverance, because he believed that God could raise his son back from the dead. Do you have that kind of faith? 
Do you have the kind of faith that when life comes into, into your situation, when a tsunami of trials come into your life and breaks the window of your crystal glass existence, do you have the faith to say, God, I still believe. I still believe. I stand on solid ground. I stand on firm ground. When we face trials, James is saying, Make those trials work for you, not against you. Perseverance. Endurance. You know, when I think of endurance, my mind goes to Michael Jordan. There have been debates in the last weeks since there is no sport, so everyone has to develop a sport debate. Who is the greatest basketball player ever? And the consensus is Michael Jordan. <laughs> But do you realize that in high school, when he was a junior in high school, he and his bus best buddy wanted to be on the high school team, and he didn't even make the high school team. He was put on the varsity team, and he was so broken over this rejection. He, was, he just had his dreams. He just had a rock. His coach threw a rock at his life and shattered his dream. Unlike any good American teenager, Michael Jordan went to his room to cry and blame the whole world and do social distancing against the whole world. No. He went to the gym and he started practicing and he started working out. And he went to that university team and started scoring 20, 40 points. He started riffing it up because he was saying, I will not allow anything to throw a rock against my dreams. And if you listen to the story of Michael Jordan life, he will tell you that there were two trials that shaped him. And the first one was being cut from his high school team. And the second one, they have asked Michael Jordan, what do you think made you so great? You know what he said? The Detroit Pistons. Remember those bad boys from Detroit? Jordan was a young, phenomenal player and doing incredible things and dunking with his tongue on the side of his mouth and, and, and doing all this great poses and these, but he could never beat Detroit. The bad boys would push him around and and they would swat the ball away from him. And one day, after six seasons, Michael Jordan had had enough of the bad boys, and he started going to the gym. And all summer, he started practicing, and he started pumping iron, and he started becoming more aggressive until he defeated the Detroit Pistons on the way to a conference finals. And he looks back and he says, it is because of the Detroit Pistons while we, the reason why we won six NBA championships, three back-to-backs twice. He's saying, I have endurance. I persevered because of those rocks that life threw at me. So God is telling us, allow your trials to work for you not against you. Respond to trials with an attitude of joy, with supreme happiness, because trials will test us and make our faith stronger. And he says one reason is perseverance. But he gives us a second reason in verse 4. He says, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking in anything. You see the second reason why we should have an attitude of joy in responding to trials? Do you see why trials can work for us and not against us? It produces endurance, but it produces the character of maturity. That when the testing puts heat in our lives, and when we hold on to God, and when we hold on to His promises, and when we fall and worship God, when we look in expectations and we say, from where is my help coming from? I look to the mountains where my God is. I look to the mountains where the one who created sea and land, the birds and the beasts of the fields, is the one who holds my life. And he says, once you allow 
your faith to be tested by trials. You become mature. You have character. And you're complete, not lacking anything. Well, speaking about basketball, we don't have any sports going on right now. The draft is coming up, NFL draft next week. So let me give you a little sports entertainment. My favorite all-time sports team was the 1986-1987 Los Angeles Lakers, Showtime. And when I read this verse of having character and maturity, not needing anything, I always go back to the 1986 Lakers. Do you know why? Because they were almost unbeatable. They have Kareem Jabbar po po posting up in the middle. They had on the side the, the three-point specialist Cooper and Byron Scott. And they had that sweet jumper by James Worthy. And then they had Magic, Showtime Magic Johnson, who, who was a circus. It was a circus to go to a game to see the Lakers play. And when they went up against the Celtics, and the Celtics started shutting down the inside game, they would go outside to the three points. And when they started defending the three points, they would give those 16, 18-foot jumpers to James Worthy. And when nothing was working, they just said, Pat Riley would say, magic, showtime, and he would take the whole game over by himself. They were hard to beat because they had short game. They had post game. They had three point game. They had showtime game. And that's what trials produce in our lives. That we are so equipped that it doesn't matter where the rock goes against our window, against our door, against our emotions, against our spirituality, against our economy, against our health. We will stand strong in our faith in God. That's what the testing of our faith produces. Do not allow trials to defeat you. Make trials work for you and not against you. And that happens when we have an attitude of joy. Knowing that God uses even the worst of situations to make the best for us. I got a call from some friends a few days ago. And it was a message that a man that I grew up with in the Baptist church in Costa Rica, Jamaican man used to sing in the choir, eh, died in New York. And I, his, his son went to youth group with me and I called him up, I called Gandhi up because I knew that this was gonna be hard. Gandhi lost his brother uh, over a year ago. And after his brother, older brother passed away, it was a few months later that his beautiful 20 something niece suddenly died and now his father. And I called Gandhi up and I said, Gandhi, I heard your father pass away. What happened, what happened? And Gandhi said, I got up and I was having breakfast and I was having my coffee and I, dad had been ill and I went into his room and I just saw he looked very weird. He looked very weird. So I called 911 and he said, they worked on him for, for over an hour. They really worked on him but we lost dad. And I said, Gandhi, I know it's hard to lose your dad. He says, yeah, I know, I know. My dad and I, we had our disagreements. There were habits in his life that I always fight with him over, but he was still my dad. And it's hard to lose him. And I said to Gandhi, I said, Gandhi, when I heard the news, I started praying. And as I was praying for you, as I was praying for your family, as I was praying for everyone, I had this peace about me. And I said, you know what? Your dad is in heaven. He is reunited with Armand, your brother. And he is reunited with your niece. They're in heaven. And my buddy on the phone screamed out, Hallelujah, amen, amen, brother. And he had his faith being tested. But because he had an attitude 
of that joy that his loved ones are with God. That's why the Bible says, absent from the body, present with the Lord. And his faith was encouraged because the reality of death, the Bible says, nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in, which is in Christ Jesus, nor death, nor persecution, nor tribulation, nor nakedness, nor demons, nor angels. We are in a truck that is bulletproof and trials can't crack the windows of our faith. May crack our economy, may crack our health, may crack our culture, but nothing will crack our faith. Allow trials to work for you, not against you. God bless you.
let us receive the benediction and as as you go out your business and your home and those of you who can go out and do your work and may God bless you may God give you strength and uh, we will continue to pray for one another we will continue to support one another and we will continue to allow our faith to inspire us to face whatever trials life may bring people of God you're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ People of God, may the spirit of joy, may the spirit of wisdom, may the spirit of God continue to support you as you continue to serve him, as you continue to love one another, as you continue to live for God in this crazy culture. God be with you today and forevermore.